Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time and joining us today again. Uh, Shopcare is proud to host our part two of Machine Safety Series with none other than Brent Sutton. Um, for those who took part uh, last week, will know it was a very interesting session. For those who haven't watched or wasn't present there, I'll encourage you to go watch part one. It's currently available on our website as well as on the YouTube channel. Um, if you don't know where there is, um, we can just go on YouTube and just shop, uh, look for shop care. You'll find it over there. But I'm not going to waste too much time. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Brent. I'll be in the background, guys. So please make use of the chat function. I'll make sure it works for everyone. If you want any comments or any suggestions, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to ask any questions to myself or Brent, please use the Q&A function um, or the chat also works fine. Uh, without further ado, um, I'm handing over to Brent. Brent, it's all yours. Hey, that's great. Thanks, Wes, and, and welcome back, everyone. Um, hopefully you've had time to recover from two weeks ago. Um, and it's really great that we get into the uh, next stage in our journey around um, uh, learning from uh, machinery safety. So in this session today, we're going to be exploring the application of um, standards and machinery safety. And in this module, we're going to explore um, the purpose of the standards and the history. How do these standards relate to the Health and Safety at Work Act? Uh, what do the standards actually cover? And I'll give you some insights around what they cover. And also, where can I access them? So um, that's going to be really important because um, these standards are always cited in prosecutions from WorkSafe around machinery harm. So the standard series is referred to, it's a joint standard, um, Australia New Zealand standards, the 4024 series. Now what's really interesting to note is that we, we haven't gone out and developed our own set of standards. We have adopted those standards. And those standards have been adopted from uh, ISO 12100 and ISO 31000. So ISO 12100 is the international standard for, um, for managing machinery risk. And ISO 31000 is the international standard for risk management. And other parts of 4024 have adopted the EN series. Um, that stands for the uh, European series of standards. So for instance, if we buy equipment from Europe, um, for instance, you know, German made equipment, that equipment should have what's called a certificate of conformity and that certificate will outline what standards it relates to and in the new zealand standards it will include all the links to the en standards or the iso standards so it's really great because it just creates a bit of a library around that so how does the hierarchy of guidance relate so if these standards are being relied on by the regulator as what would be the notion of reasonably practicable, where does that sit? And we're just going to explore that. So at the moment, we have, uh, as we talked about last week, there were some very specific provisions in the Health and Safety Work Act around on the machinery, around people that manage, control, design, manufacture, et cetera. Um, there are new regulations coming in, and as we talked about the other week, we're expecting those to be in come into place in the first quarter of next year. But under the general risk regulations, there's this whole issue here about um, identifying those hazards and putting controls into place. We then have WorkSafe's own guidance back in 2014, and um, that guidance is still very much relevant today, even though that guidance came out before the joint New Zealand standards came out. But the reality is it's still very good guidance. And then we have the standards themselves, the 4024 series. And at the moment, I think they go up to about 2020 at the moment. And with all standards, they need to be reviewed every five years at the moment. So how do these standards relate to the notion or argument of reasonably practicable? 
we, we tend to get lost when we think about machinery safety, we tend to get lost in focusing around things like the likelihood of risk, the consequence of risks and the costs. But in actual fact, the whole notion of reasonably practicable is around knowledge about the risk and the means of mitigating it. And this is where the standards are really important because they set out for us the types of risk factors we need to think about. It outlines for us the types of approaches we can take when it comes to identifying hazards and risks and different ways of evaluating those risks as well. So let's explore that a little bit further. So there are three types of standards and they're commonly referred to as type A, type B or type C or sometimes type one, type two, type three. So type A's are very much around basic safety itself. Type B are very much around that generic component and type C are very machine specific. So let's explore that. So if we think about a type A or a type one, We've got some standards here around risk management and design principles. So these standards really help us understand what risk factors we need to think about that are very specific to machinery risk. So for example, um, some of those standards basically talk about the fact that when it comes to thinking about the nature of harm, there are two types of harms that commonly occur around machinery. One is around acute harm, that physical harm, and the other harm is around chronic harm or harm to health. And those standards talk about the fact that when we think about acute harm, we need to understand the relationship between the hazards on the machine and how people interface or how people go about doing their normal work on that machine. And those interfaces, when the hazard comes together and the person comes together, those standards, they use the language of what we call a hazardous situation. And it is those hazardous situations that could then lead to harm itself. So from my perspective, the standards are very powerful in helping us to better understand the risk management approach around machinery. Then we have the type B standards or type two standards that look very much around controls and safeguards. And those standards also look at the ergonomics of the human. So remembering that when it comes to machinery, when, when humans are working on machines across those different modes, whether it's setting up, whether it's running, whether it's cleaning, whether it's um, clearing jams, what we need to be thinking about is about their reach. And that's about the human component. So it's about reaching through, reaching over, reaching under and reaching around. And what body parts can access those openings on the machine. So let's do an example of that. So ASNZS 4024, 1601, guard selection. And in this particular standard, what's very helpful is it actually talks about a hierarchy of guarding. So we talk often about the hierarchy of controls. Well, with the machinery safety, we also have a hierarchy of guarding. And it's asking us a series of questions. And the first interesting question is it's basically saying, are the hazards present from moving parts? And when we think about those, we need to think about are those hazards present from moving parts across those different phases of the machine? Are those hazards present when we're setting up? Are those hazards present when we're doing operation? Are those hazards present when we're doing adjustment or maintenance or cleaning or clearing jams? And the standard then splits it out into three parts, but today we're going to talk about two parts. One is it saying, is access required during normal operation. Now, when I say normal, I'm not thinking here about what the organization thinks is normal. What we're looking at here is what workers see as being normal. 
remembering that there's a concept of machinery safety called reasonable foreseeable misuse. So it's not about the organization asking the question, why would someone do that? The question should be asked, is there an opportunity for a worker to be able to do that? And when we think about that, the hierarchy says that we must choose fixed guarding first. And if we can't use fixed guarding, then we can use an interlock guard. If we can't use an interlock guard, then we can use a self-closing guard. And if we can't use a self-closing guard, then we need to use some present sensing devices and some complementary controls. Well, present pressure sensing devices uh, could be light curtains, could be pressure mats, could be other types of um, camera or other types of um, technology that is detecting the presence of a person. Uh, complementary devices, those are such things as um, beacons, you know, flashing lights, or audible warnings. But what they're saying here is that you need to follow the hierarchy. So when it comes down to the, recent, the notion of reasonable practicable, what you have to think about is why couldn't we fit fixed guarding? Why couldn't we use interlocking guards? Why couldn't we simply use self-closing guards? Because sadly, what I see quite often is the fact that I see lots of light curtains. And when I ask people to share with me why they couldn't have done those other things, they can't tell me. And the notion of reasonably practicable also includes why could you not apply higher order controls? On the other side, no access is required during the operation. Then they're saying, right, move to interlocking guard first. If you can't do that, then a self-closing guard. If you can't do that, then something that's adjustable. If you can't do that, something that is movable. And if you can't do that, then go to those light curtains or those pressure mats or those other forms of sensors or two-handed controls. And what do we mean by two-handed controls? Um, that is where that for the machine to perform its function, there are either levers or buttons that the operator has to press simultaneously. And during the pressing of those buttons, their hands are kept away from the danger zone. So think of that like, um, for instance, um, a guillotine. Um, think of that with different types of um, um, lifting type equipment where you're keeping parts away from it during that presence. So this is where those standards can become very powerful because it actually helps us to determine whether our risk management strategy um, can work or not. And then we have type C. And type C standards, that is where the standard is very specific to a type of machine. And what I like about type C standards in particular is they cover off all the other elements of the standards around that specific type of machine. So at the moment, probably one of the most common machines that we have in the workplace, and probably one of the best standards um, around that is the standard for conveyors. And the first thing is that the standards actually describes when is something a conveyor. And that's really interesting because for it to be a conveyor under the machinery standards, it actually has to be energized in some way. So it has to have you know, drives or belts or pulleys, some form of drive mechanism itself. So those gravity fed rollers that you see on some types of conveyors, where the, you know, it's just the rollers, it's a free roller and the item is pushed by, by gravity, they don't sit under the machinery safety standards. So let's explore some of the things that those standards talk about. Well, the first thing, and, and the one that comes up quite often, is that when we're doing hazard ID in particular, there's always a question that is asked, when do I know that I've done enough? 
when do I know that I have identified all the hazards on a machine? Well, the reality is that you'll never know. There is no 100%. But what we can do and what the machinery safety standards can do for us is it can inform us of the common types of sources of harm, the common types of hazards from those sources of harms and where they sit. So in essence, what we can do is that we can use these standards as a way of creating some form of checklist that we can use as part of that assurance process. And in a later session, I will be making available um, a download for you where we've taken some of these core principles and turned it into a checklist to support you. But the checklist by itself doesn't give you all the answers. What the standards are supporting us to do is think of from an assurance perspective. So on the screen, I've, I've chosen a couple of the key ones around electricity and around mechanical. And if you look at the mechanical component, you can see there that they have identified the seven major hazards that are present on conveyors around people. And they've also identified what are the consequences of that. Well, that becomes powerful because the good thing about a checklist is allows us to focus in on those specific things. So you, um, your people, your reps, they can go out and they can go out and they can look for and ask the questions, how could I become entangled on that machine? And the checklist that will be provided will also say things like, um, for instance, you know, loose clothing or rags, things like that. And it's a great way of having a conversation with your workers because those workers can tell you. What I see quite often with machinery is that the people that undertake these assessments don't engage the workers. They look at the machine by itself. You really have to understand that relationship between how people do their job across those different modes and when those hazards are present. So that's why I think if, if I was a betting person, and if you've got conveyors in your workplace, that is one of the key standards I would be purchasing. Um, other interesting areas that that standard covers off, for instance, it will tell you um, how many e-stops are needed on your conveyors. Remembering that the length of the conveyor is a major factor in determining how many e-stops. What I find quite interesting is that with every conveyor, there must be an emergency stop on the control panel. If the conveyor is longer than um, 2.5 meters, there needs to be an e-stop on the head and the tail of the conveyor as well. And of course, with conveyors, we also run emergency pull stops because people who work on or near the conveyor need to be able to get access to an emergency stop. So rather than having lots of e-stops along the length of the conveyor, that's where it's quite often that we have emergency pull cords to act in that complementary perspective. But regardless of the pull cords, there must always be an emergency stop on the control panel of that. Uh, other things that that standard explores, it also explores the issues around uh, nip points. So it goes into the very specifics around the ergonomics of the body. So for instance, it basically says that if we've got a nip point on a roller, that if the gap is less as five mil or less, there is no nip point risk. Or if the gap is 120 mil or wider, there is no nip point risk. If we think about the ergonomics of that, what they're saying 
is that if it's five mil or less, you can't get a finger into that gap. If it's 120 mil or more, it means you can get a whole arm in there, which means that the arm can't become entrapped into that gap. So once again, that's where the standards are very useful because they help us to map out the uh, very specific risks that exist around conveyors. So if we go back to it, um, the standards are designed to support us in our risk decision making process. We need to understand that the standards were written through the eyes of people that design plant or equipment. And the standards can sometimes use language that is very engineering type based. What I like to do is I like to use the standards as a form of assurance. That way, if we think about it, we can use things like um, a checklist to make sure we've identified you know, the potential hazards on the machine. We can engage with workers to understand how work is really done on that machine. We can look at the existing controls in place on that machine to make sure that they are fit for purpose. So quite often what I see is I see particularly um, older machines where those safety features um, aren't current or out of date. And I get asked the question all the time, are the standards retrospective? And the answer is yes. So if you've got a machine built in the 1960s and people are having to access a danger zone and you are relying on a limit switch or a magnetic switch, then that machine does not meet the current standards and that needs to be improved. And for the cost of retrofitting that feature, if you looked at the argument of reasonably practicable about costs, if you were charged, then it would have been reasonably practicable for you have to installed an interlock in that situation. So it's really important that we look at the machine, we understand what the current controls are to make sure they're fit for purpose. And at the same time, understanding how people interface and communicate at the same time with that machine. So this is a great opportunity to um, open up for questions. I've also put there the link about where you can access the standards as well. Um, you know, obviously Standards New Zealand is there. And I also understand that they have bundled a whole raft of the standards together. So you get it for a bundle price. But at a minimum, think about what is the biggest machine you've got and try and go out and find the standard for that. So I know, for instance, in the waste industry, whilst there's not any uh, uh, Australian or New Zealand standards around um, compactors or waste machines, there are in the EN standards. So it's always useful that if you've got these machines and you are concerned about the risk of those machines, you can do some research and you can find the appropriate type C standard for that machine. So questions from people. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brent. While everybody is uh, thinking up their questions or uh, writing them down, um, I just want to quickly take this opportunity, guys, just to let you know that don't forget next week and the 29th of November, we have another webinar on chain of responsibility. So please make sure that you uh, register for that. And also then don't miss out on part three of the machine safety series, which is on the 6th of December. What I will do is to make things a bit, maybe a bit easier, Brent, is uh, potentially just uh, open up the lines for everybody so they can ask live questions so they don't have to write them down. Um, so, but while you're writing those questions, guys, um, I'll be in the background trying to um, open up the lines for you.
please feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you would like to ask uh, Brent a live question. I found it very interesting, um, Brent, I must be honest. Uh, I don't have any question from my end, but I'm pretty sure somebody will. Yeah, look, it's I always find it interesting because the answers that we're seeking <laughs> are there. <laughs> and of course, it's easier in hindsight, once it goes wrong, that hazard becomes quite visible. Um, and, you know, I understand that it's really hard to foresee things. But if we use the standards and, you know, we take a logical process, um, we can get a long way. So Matt, you've, you've come off mute. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, just had one question. I think there was a slide about how standards relate to, to HASWA. And yeah. if, I, if I remember correctly, I think you had the WorkSafe Best Practice Guide placed above the standards. Um, I find the WorkSafe NZ best practice guide for use safe use of machines to be next to useless for from uh, from my point of view, but I guess I I always go standards first over and above that um, because standards are based on international best practice. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I I wouldn't place WorkSafe best practice guidelines above the standards at all. In fact, there's some that some parts of it that I blatantly disagree with. You, uh, there, there are conflicts. I think there's, there's, there's two things. Um, what, one is um, it hasn't been updated since 2014, which, which, and some of it is still relevant, other parts aren't relevant. But if, if we look at it through the legal lens, the hierarchy of guidance um, standards themselves are right down the bottom. Really? A, yes. a, a below a best practice guideline from WorkSafe? Well, unless there's a conflict. So if, if the standards references um, later material or makes use of later information, then the standard would have order of hierarchy over the um, good practice guidelines from WorkSafe. Okay. And, but, and I think most of them have been updated since 2014. So, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Standards are supposed to be updated every five years. They're supposed to be. And that's why there is a working group around that. Um, and I think, Matt, it all becomes a redundant conversation when the new regs kick in, when the plant and structures regs come in next year. Then obviously the regs becomes the uh, primary tool. And of course, those regs from the versions that I've seen um, reference 4024. Yes, yep, absolutely. So yeah, yeah I've, I've seen the same thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, no, not a problem. The um, and I think that's the right way to do it too. Um, yep. Yeah. And it was just an interesting observation on this. Yeah. Look, um, I mean, th th there are some parts of the WorkSafe guidance that is really helpful. There are other parts that are less helpful. Um, mm. I, I say to people, in actual fact, you're being, you're the, being very very polite there, Brent. <laughs> for, for a change, I know I'm I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. Um, uh, also, I think um, the uh, the WorkSafe British Columbia have also published some very, very good information around machinery safety as well. And and, and, and compressed air safety as well. Um, yeah. yeah they, do, they do good stuff. They do good stuff. And, and I'm happy, I'll, I'll make a little sheet available, but in particular, they released a, a thing about safeguard, they called it a safeguard table. And in that table, they explored the different types of designs of safeguards and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And I find that really helpful when you encounter um, different types of machinery, because I'm not an engineer and I don't want to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, but what I look for is I look to understand, um, you know, how can that guard be, be uh, misused, not blaming the worker, but simply saying, has that guard been designed to support that worker to be successful in their work? Yep, and there's an increasing focus on um, attention to motivations to defeat um, that we're seeing as well. Um, yeah, because... 
yeah, yeah, go for it, Matt. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just going to 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 sort of rewind a little bit on the on the other side of it is that I think there's a clear difference between guidelines and standards, and to not misuse a guideline when when a standard should be used. So the the guidelines from Canada are great just to look at things through a different lens, but they're not a substitution for using um, a standard. Um, no, and, a that, standards, and a standards approach to engineering guards. I, I agree because the, you know the, 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 the guidelines helps to build our knowledge and understanding. The standards give us that technical data that we need um, that are reflective of um, that machine. I, I think the issue that I have is that they are design standards. They are, yep. Yep. I completely agree with that criticism, um, but this is where um, for design of guards, we need to get safety professionals involved um, as opposed to trying to interpret those design standards through incorrect means. So, Absolutely. And look, and a well-designed machine can reduce a lot of the human factors that we fixate on. Yep. So if, if I've got workers needing to access a machine frequently to clear jams, a well-designed machine will basically put that machine in a safe state for that person to do that job. Yep. Relying on the action of the person, not their ability to follow the, follow the process or follow the rules or meet the goals. Agreed. Um, really good pointing out of a misconception about that, um, about the age of guards versus the age of the standards. Um, I find exactly that same misconception. There's probably one other major misconception that I find is that people see a machine with a CE mark on it and assume that a CE mark means that it's compliant. That's probably the other biggest misconception that I see. Uh, it, um, has, it has no meaning. It has no meaning in safety. It has no meaning. But it's oh. a really, really common misconception. People think that it's a quality mark or something of that nature. It no. absolutely is not. Um, and and I've, sadly, I've seen, yeah, yeah. And more frequently, it's coming out of the Asian markets of that machinery. Oh, there's very few people that can identify a China export mark versus a CE mark from Europe. Yeah. Um, most people can't tell the difference. Um, and but even if it is a CE mark from Europe. Uh, it still gives you no protection. Look, on Matt, I've even seen a recent example of a machine that came in from Europe, um, but the domestic model and the export model had different safety features. Absolutely right. Yeah, seen the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, once again, there's a reason why the export model is cheaper. Okay. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes they've just decided to um, to to make some extra profit. Yeah, yeah. So in a later part of the module series, we'll be exploring um, due diligence around um, purchasing of machinery as as yep. well, because that's Fantastic. really important. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, really appreciate what you're doing, Brent. It's um, just great to I, I listen in because it's just great to hear professional communication. Uh, around the, the subjects that we're involved in. So, um, yeah, it's great work. Thank you. No, look, thank you. Look, I, I've been passionate about machinery for quite some time now because it makes up so much harm. And, um, you know, this this series came about from an enforceable undertaking. And, you know, I think EUs um, can help us to raise the benchmark in safety. So hence the reason why I, I think this type of um, um, approach. And are there local New Zealand courses that can do a machinery safety? That's a really interesting question, Vanessa. Um, obviously I have to raise a conflict of interest here, but uh, at, at the moment to help practitioners gain knowledge and understanding around assessing risk, uh, there is a very good course um, and of course, I have to say it's a good course because I wrote it. That's delivered through the EMA, and that's a two-day course that is also linked to a unit standard, and it is also recognised 
by NZISM as part of that professional practice. But for people who want to design guards, then the course they need to complete um, basically is the only company that runs that course is, is PILS, P-I-L-Z. And that is for the person to become a machinery safety expert or a CMSE, and that's a German qualification. And that course is really hard for safety people because that course has been designed for engineers. So it's about, you know, um, electrical, pneumatic, hydraulic risks, all those things, and it requires a 75% pass rate. So the two-day course that I developed for the EMA is really for people that want to build that knowledge and competency around doing effective and efficient um, assessments around um, machines. And in particular, it's built around getting good worker engagement and participation with machinery as well. So I get quite a few um, uh, reps who are looking to build that competency as well coming on that course. And engineers. I love a good engineer because at the end of it, they change their view. They change their view from thinking that workers are the problem to working out that actually talking to the workers, we can actually build better safety. Excellent. That sounds good. Uh, any other questions for Brent before we close today's session? I'll give you a couple of seconds just to pop through, either write it or just come off mute. But it seems like that is basically it. Well, um, Brent, yet again, um, thank you very much for today. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you to everybody. I know it's a busy, busy time for everybody um, when it comes to manufacturing and the supply chain in general. Um, but appreciate that you can be here and uh, participate in this. And I hope to see you next week and at part three as well with Brent. Until I see you guys again, um, have a good one. And oh, just before I forget, this one will also be on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully within by the end of, or by the end of next week. Until I see you guys again, see ya, bye-bye.